it is a pleasure to welcome Professor Erin McKinnon Hanses as a guest speaker at a seminar on Eros Amor, the erotic culture of the early global world. A seminar that takes place at UCLA under the twice felicitous auspices of the Department of Classics and of um, the CMRS Center for Early Global Studies. I am deeply grateful to the Chair of Classics, Professor Alex Purvis, who is here, and to the Director of CMRS SEX, Professor Zrinka Stauliak, who is also here, for offering me this marvelous opportunity. It is an honor, and I think that perhaps Zrinka would like to say a few words about this particular kind of seminar. Yes, thank you, Julia. I am very grateful to you for organizing this and for allowing uh, CMRS Center for Early Global Studies to be a part of this wonderful adventure. The, the seminar today and the overall quarterly seminar that, that Julia is um, uh, doing uh, with the Center for Early Global Studies is part of our program that's called CMRS SEGS Research Seminars. And what we do is we provide funding to UCLA faculty to bring distinguished scholars to UCLA to participate in seminars or symposia and present lectures. And so it is because it is part of the graduate program as well, it is then an opportunity for uh, students at UCLA from various fields and disciplines to interact with um, the, uh, the scholars, the visiting scholars. So I want to encourage you to take a look and maybe I'll put it in the chat, um, a look at our program that we have developed as part of, as a larger kind of framework for these seminars, which is the um, uh, certificate, graduate certificate in global medieval studies that is part of our reframing and updating of the center. Uh, for those of you who may not know this, the center has become this, as of this year, is now called Center for Early Global Studies. Um, so this is part of our reframing. And again, I'm very welcome. I'm, I'm very uh, grateful to, uh, to Julia Sisa for organi organizing this. And I welcome all of you to this first um, public session of, of the seminar um, under the auspices of uh, the Center for Early Global Studies. And of course, with thanks as always to the Department of Classics for, for wonderful collaborations. Thank you, Alex, as well. Thank you, Drinka. Um... And uh, to open today's special event, uh, the lecture by Erin McKenna Hanse, A Woman's Pleasure, Philosophy and Sexuality in the Poetry of Sulpicha, whom I will introduce in a moment, I would like to say a few words, very few, about the seminar itself, the content and the guiding questions of the seminar itself. Now in all societies, the erotic experience is to say the least complex. It is shaped by norms, habits, emotions, sensations, and manners of living the body. Such an experience is a matter of concern, inquiry, ritualizations, and representations across a variety of discourses. Most of them normative, some of them performative of domain of knowledge, of aesthetic creativity at large. In the seminar that frames today's guest lecture, we take a resolute stand. We look at this phenomenon, the erotic, as a matter of desire, pleasure, bodies, institutions. By focusing on these four aspects, of the erotic experience as precisely an erotic experience, we go beyond a pragmatic of the sexual acts, beyond the controversial notion of sexuality, beyond sex as power, and above all, beyond the controversial, uh, in my opinion, dogma of a pre-modern before before an interpretive approach to what is felt, before the emergence of an erotic lifestyle, before the notion of erotic inclination. But we are not fascinated by the quest for an already either, quite the opposite. We bring to the fore what was truly relevant in the erotic cultures of the ancient world, sensuality. 
In ancient societies, sensuality is far more important than sex. To be sensual or sensuous means to pursue the pleasure of the senses. Now, among the senses, there is touch, and touch is the essence of sex as the congress of bodies. Think of Aristotle. Sensuality includes contact of the skin and the flesh, of course, but also the pleasures of all the other sense organs. A capacious attitude that encompasses all kinds of perception, sensuality is the overarching erotic experience. While it may well include coition, which is merely a kind of haptic interaction among others, it cannot be reduced to the execution of one particular sexual act. Sensuality involves caresses, embraces, kisses, gazes, and any other wishful, mnemonic, or imaginary aesthetic approach to another person, embodied person. It is about actual sensations and about their possibilities. It vastly exceeds, therefore, the mechanics of penetration and act that, although overinterpreted and overrated in contemporary scholarship, is seldom mentioned in ancient literary sources, and for a very good reason except in medical context, in comedy, and in otherwise chastising genres of discourse, genital or anal penetration was irrelevant. Sensuality, on the contrary, captures the actual concerns of ancient thinkers and writers and uh, painters and sculptors about eros and amor. Far from opposing love and sex, Homeric characters, Sappho, her Greek and Roman successors, Plato and Ovid, understand the erotic amorous life inseparably from a quest for the pleasure of all the senses and from either a sorrowful, hyperrealistic phenomenology of its failure or from a confident art of taking pleasure successfully. In this framework, I'm delighted to welcome Professor Erin McKenna Hanses, who teaches at Penn State University. Professor Hanses has received her PhD in Classics from Fordham University in 2018, and an AB in Classics from Harvard University in 2009. She specializes in Latin poetry of the late Republic and early empire, and her current research focuses on responses to Lucretius in Roman love elegy, as well as elegiac engagement with the Epicureanism of both Lucretius and his Greek language contemporary, Philodemus. Other research areas include gender and identity in ancient Greece and Rome, and the intersection between medical and literary descriptions of pleasure in classical literature. Professor Hanses is a sought after speaker who has presented her work in Italy, Mexico, in Serbia, in Canada, and across the United States. She has published Embodying Nature, Virgil's Defeminization of Lucretian Natura in the Georgic in 2021, and Criticizing Love's Critic, Epicurean Parisia, and as an instructional mode in Ovidian Love Elegy in a volume entitled Philosophy in Ovid, Ovid as a Philosopher, um, uh, I suppose in press <laughs> for 2022. Please join me in welcoming Professor Hanses, who will talk about a woman's pleasure, philosophy and sexuality in the poetry of Sulpicia. After the talk, we will have a period of questions and answers, and please be so kind as to use the raised hand feature. We uh, will be all together for more or less one hour and a half. Uh, Professor Hansen, thank you for being with us. The floor is yours. Well, thanks so much to you, Julia, for that introduction um, and for inviting me to be a part of this seminar on Eros and Amor. Uh, I look forward to our discussion following the talk as well. Let me share my screen and uh, hopefully everyone can see this. Okay, yes? Success, okay. wonderful. Okay, so then I'll begin. 
Um, so I am going to be talking today uh, about uh, the elegies both of and about Sulpicia, um, though I would like to start with a passage from the late Roman Republican author Lucretius. So this selection appears in um, book four of Lucretius's poem on Epicurean philosophy, De Rerum Natura, or On the Nature of Things. And it comes in the midst of his diatribe against uh, romantic love. So Lucretius writes, nor does a woman always sigh with feigned love. She who has embraced the body of a man and joins it with hers and holds him moistening his mouth and sucking his lips. You see, she often does this from the heart and seeking shared pleasures incites him to run the course of love. This passage describes a woman seeking the pleasures, it seems, of sexual intercourse with a man. And this woman is defined by her actions. She holds her lover, kisses him, joins their bodies, and does all of this sincerely as she seeks shared pleasures. The episode thus offers a rare view of a female agent in a work focused on leading the Roman man to Epicurean pleasure the Roman male elite in general, and Lucretius's addressee Memmius in particular. Yet Lucretius does not present this pleasure-seeking woman as worthy of admiration, nor does he celebrate her active participation in the sexual act. Rather, she is an illustration of the powerful lure of desire and a demonstration of why people pursue romantic relationships, even though they are painful and distracting. Nevertheless, this brief glimpse of women as partners in the pursuit of pleasure as recipients of a reciprocal pleasure contains a significant implication. If women, like men, can experience the downfalls and distractions of romantic love, then they too can benefit from Lucretius's Epicurean therapy. They too can attain philosophical pleasure, what Lucretius calls voluptas. Regardless of who his intended audience was, Lucretius here implies that women can be a part of the Epicurean discourse on love. In fact, there is a rich, if complicated, tradition of women serving as partners in Epicurean philosophical discourse, brought to light by, for example, Pamela Gordon's work on female Epicureans. Many of the women known to have been among Epicurus's adherents in the garden in the Greek East are thought to have been prostitutes or hetairai. However, as Gordon has endorsed, there is no reason these women could not also be true participants in philosophical discourse instead of, or in addition to being sexual partners. In the Roman sphere, there is further evidence for women as a part of the Epicurean discourse in the late Republic in the writings of Lucretius's Greek language contemporary Philodemus. In his On Frank Speech, a record of the teachings of Zeno of Sidon, Philodemus includes a passage which describes the typical reactions of female students to certain types of Epicurean Frank criticism or parousia. This reference supports the continuous presence of women in the garden through Philodemus's time. By portraying a female agent in his poem then, Lucretius is participating in an enduring tradition of including women in Epicurean philosophical discourse. His sexual woman represents the shared culpability in the kind of obsessive attachment that Lucretius eschews, the erotic attachment that disturbs the mind's ataraxia. By necessity then, she represents the other half of the Epicurean conversation, the female half, silent in Lucretius's own text, but present in the culture of late Republican Rome. So in this talk, I will argue that one woman in particular, um, writing perhaps in the first century BC, BCE with a literary tradition extending into the first century CE, recognized the tacit message in Lucretius's image of female pleasure seeking. The Latin elegist Sulpicia, who is not depicted in this fresco, um, though I do think that this, this woman's sort of embrace of um, her own sexuality is um, fitting for this talk. Uh, the Latin elegist Sulpicia, the only female uh, Latin love elegist extant, makes pointed reference to the precise Lucretian passage that I started with in her poetry. Engaging particularly with Lucretius's diction and broadly, I argue, with the tenets of Epicureanism, she inserts herself into Lucretius's Epicurean discourse on love. 
both as another pleasure-seeking woman and perhaps as a fellow philosopher. While the male love elegists to Bullis for Perseus and Ovid more typically depicted frustrations with their female lovers or puellae and with the various rivals for their women's affections, Sulpicia promotes the mutuality of pleasure between men and women, implied by the communia gaudia in the passage on your screens, and represented elsewhere in Lucretius by the phrase mutua voluptas, shared pleasure. In engaging with a Lucretian episode in which a woman has agency, Sulpicia seizes an opportunity to present her own solution to the tension between romantic love and ataraxia, or that freedom from cares, which Epicureans seek to attain. So I also argue that Lucretius was not the, Epi the only Epicurean with whom Sulpicia engaged. Her relationship with her beloved Corinthus echoes that of, I think, Philodemus with his love, Xanthope. There we go. An Epicurean with a substantial following in the Bay of Naples, Philodemus authored both prose treatises on Epicurean philosophy and a number of Greek epigrams treating romantic themes. In these epigrams, his beloved Xanthope serves both as a precursor to the elegiac Puella and, as David Sider has argued, as a female partner in philosophical discourse. In her own elegies, Sulpicia plays on this relationship between narrator and beloved in Philodemus and brings out this idea of shared philosophical pleasure between men and women, something she is uniquely engaged in as a female writer in a male-dominated cultural milieu. Now, of course, the transmission of Sulpicia's poems through the works of the elegist Tibullus has led to a questioning of Sulpicia's identity in modern scholarship, which could complicate or in fact even invalidate my argument that a woman called Sulpicia was part of any literary discourse. So within the book, um, within book three, that is of the Corpus Tibullianum are 11 poems, which are in some way connected to Sulpicia. In the scholarly Communis Opinio, poems 13 to 18 are considered the quote unquote true poems of the female elegist Sulpicia and are thought to have been composed at some point in either the late first century BCE or the early first century CE. Poems eight through 12 are considered to have been composed by an unknown author, some amicus Sulpiciae, a friend of Sulpicia or a fan of her work, writing perhaps um, in the first century CE. The name Sulpicia appears as a persona and possible narrator in both the poems of the Garland and the quote unquote true poems. Accordingly, in this talk, I look broadly at the narrative voice that Sulpicia represents in Corpus Tibullianum Book Three. After all, even an amicus Sulpiciae would have presumably intended to capture in the poems of the Garland the kinds of sentiments expressed by Sulpicia herself and the learned literary engagement of her poems. So when I refer to Sulpicia throughout, I mean the persona that maintains a presence in Corpus Tibullianum 3, 8 to 18, and not necessarily the author of any or all of those poems. So in the remainder of my talk, I will begin by analyzing the ways in which Sulpicia cites and adapts the Lucretian episode we looked at earlier on women's pleasure to insert herself into a learned discourse with Lucretius. I then consider Sulpicia's engagement with Philodemus, particularly in the metapoetic styling of her relationship with her beloved Corinthus. I conclude by showing how Sulpicia embodies mutua voluptas, both the shared sexual pleasure Lucretius portrays and the shared philosophical pleasure Philodemus evokes. I ultimately aim to demonstrate that Sulpicia has made a place for herself as the female Roman voice in the Epicurean discourse on love. Okay, so to start, Sulpicia and Lucretius. Lucretius's description of a woman who seeks mutual pleasure is contained, um, as I mentioned, in the lengthy sexual digression at the end of book four of the De Rerum Natura, henceforth DRN. This digression has been the subject of much scholarly commentary, but the specific lines on a woman's sexual pleasure um, with which I began this talk, and I'll put them up again, have been less frequently addressed. Lucretius certainly did not prioritize a female point of view in the DRN, 
And yet it is notable that he not only touches on the subject of a woman's sexual pleasure, but even elaborates on it at some length. The episode has no apparent model um, in the body of gynecological treatises predating Lucretius's poem. And those texts in fact have even less to say than Lucretius on the subject of a woman's pleasure. Um, and with the exception of scattered implications in Serenus of Ephesus and a brief suggestion each in the Hippocratic Corpus and the Aristotelian Historia Animalium and the writings of Galen, women's sexual pleasure is hardly acknowledged. Even the Roman encyclopedist Celsus, who wrote a major medical treatise in the early imperial period, is silent on the subject. Lucretius, it seems, had a specific and non-scientific goal in including this passage, namely to illustrate why both women and men find themselves ensnared in the bonds of love. What Lucretius creates then is not a clinical description of a woman's pleasure, but rather a persuasive poetic image of love's mutually destructive power. Though the mutuality of pleasure between men and women that this passage embodies is generally not questioned, the DRN itself is not a text known for showing women agency. As Georgia Nugent has observed of Lucretius's poem that, quote, the human soul, indeed the human mind to which the poem is addressed, turns out to be the possession solely of male readers. The female is not imagined as a potential convert. Instead, she is never represented in the poem as capable of thought. Yet, oh, end quote, sorry. Um, yet a woman who sighs with love, suspirat amore, whether that love is feigned, ficto, or not, is clearly capable of thinking, feeling, and expressing her pleasure. In addition, Lucretius makes the woman in this passage the subject of each active verb. Jungit, tenet, facet ex animo, quirens, gaudia. This is, as I read it, one of the only instances of female agency in the whole of the DRN, and it thus deserves closer attention. The first verb in this passage to give the woman agency is suspirat, of the phrase suspirat amore. The specific combination of suspiro and amor does not, as far as I have found, occur in extant Latin literature before Lucretius. It's a novel expression unique in the DRN and defined by its sexual context. What is more, the phrase's meaning is further narrowed in that it is specifically a woman who is enjoying sex as she quote unquote sighs with love. The Lucretian turn of phrase in this precise sense apparently resonated with the elegiac authors Tibullus and Sulpicia. Tibullus 1.6 contains in the same metrical position nearly the same expression though Amore has become amores with loves as the objects to be sighed over. So Tabalus writes, she holds you, she sighs for other loves who are absent, and all of a sudden she pretends she has a headache. While Tabalus here is not describing a woman who is enjoying sex with her current lover, in this case her husband, he is describing a woman. He maintains the original context of the Lucretian phrase, that is a woman experiencing sexual desire and passion, but uses the phrase to serve his own elegiac purposes, that is to describe a woman of changeable affections. Sulpicia likewise cites the Lucretian phrase in poem 311, one of the two um, amicus poems or poems of the garland uh, narrated by the female persona Sulpicia. So there's 311. She, however, pointed, pointedly manipulates um, this phrase's meaning. So while celebrating her lover Corinthus's birthday, she expresses concern that he might be interested in other partners. So she says, but if by chance he now sighs for other loves, then I pray, sacred one, abandon those unfaithful hearths. In making Corinthus the subject, Sulpicia gives us the reverse of Lucretius's woman who is experiencing pleasure and of Tibullus's woman desiring another man. She imagines a man desiring another woman, reversing the genders and thereby drawing attention to her own. Now it may be tempting to see the phrase of spirit amores in Sulpicia not as a reference to Lucretius at all, but merely as a nod to Tibullus 1.6. However, the echoes of Lucretius in poem 311 extend beyond just this phrase. One such echo is the narrator's appeal to Venus, which appears um, immediately following the Suspirat Amores line. So 
So, um, so Pisha says, and may you not be unreasonable, Venus. Either let us serve you justly, each of us conquered, or loosen my chains. But rather, let each of us be held by a strong chain, which no day after is able to loosen. In her direct address to the goddess Venus, Sulpicia evokes the major deity of the DRN, as well as Lucretius's address to her in the opening lines of his poem. Additionally, Sulpicia spends the majority of poem 311 begging for mutual fire, mutuus ignis, and mutual love, mutuus amor. Also, shared bondage in a strong chain. These prayers have the ring of communia gaudia, the shared pleasures that Lucretius's passionate woman seeks, but they also allude more directly to another passage of Lucretius's, one that actually immediately follows his description of the pleasure-seeking woman. So Lucretius says, um, do you not also see those whom mutual pleasure has often bound, how they are tortured in shared chains? How often dogs in the crossroads wishing to leave strain eagerly in opposite directions with all their strength, though meanwhile they cling in the strong bonds of Venus. They would never do this unless they knew mutual pleasures, which can ensnare them and hold them bound. Thus, as I say again and again, there is shared pleasure. So we see here the array of Lucretian uh, diction which Sulpicia may be echoing in 311, expressions of mutual pleasure and shared chains. So here, um, interestingly, Sulpicia is conveying the typically elegiac servitium amoris, the trope of the lover as slave to the beloved, in Lucretius's words of mutual pleasure, promoting a kind of contrary constellation in which love, when equal, can be pleasurable. For Lucretius, the ob obsession inherent in love servitude is antithetical to the Epicurean ideal of ataraxia. His description of a mutual pleasure, mutua voluptas, is merely an explanation of why humans and animals submit themselves to the chains of Venus. It is in no way an endorsement. Sulpicia so too acknowledges the pain of desire. She says in 311, um, I burn beyond the other girls and I enjoy that I burn. So she's burning for Corinthus. However, where Lucretius rejects even mutual pleasure as disruptive of ataraxia, Sulpicia considers mutuality the solution. She prays to Venus that she and Corinthus both be conquered beneath the goddess's chains, or that at least she be freed from her desire. She recognizes that these are her two options for happiness, the latter a Lucretian one and the former her own assertion. Her pleadings for a mutuus ignis and a mutuus amor already ring with the sound of Lucretian mutua voluptas and communia gaudia that his passionate woman seeks. Paired with an almost direct Lucretian quote in the words suspirat amores, these echoes of mutual passion, the imagery of lovers in strong chains, and their framing in a prayer to Venus all lend this Sulpician passage an undeniably Lucretian timbre. The same image of lovers in chains also appears in the next poem of the Garland 312. This poem is typically assigned a third person narrator um, who makes a prayer for Sulpicia and her lover Corinthus. So I will say, I find the suggestion um, of Judy Hallett that Sulpicia narrates this in the third person to me the most exciting reading of this poem. So the narrator says, Juno Natalis, receive the holy heaps of incense, which a learned girl offers you with her tender hand. Today is entirely yours, and she has adorned herself for you, uh, most merrily for you, so that she may stand before your flames as a girl worthy to be seen. She attributes the reason of her dress to you, goddess, though there is someone she secretly wishes to please. But you, holy one, be favorable, and let no one tear apart lovers. But please prepare shared chains for the young man. This poem celebrates the birthday of Sulpicia and is for that reason the companion to the poem before it which treats Corinthus's birthday. It is no coincidence then that these poems both replace the typical trope of servitium amoris with mutual devotion. In poem 311 we are introduced to the idea of lovers in chains 
as a willing servitude for shared passions. When the narrator begs Venus, let there be mutual love and let each of us be held by a strong chain. In poem 312, we see a conflation of these two ideas, mutual chains. Oops, there we go. Shared chains, mutual wink clap. This poem with its Lucretian resonance is the same poem in which the narrator, perhaps Sulpicia herself, calls this woman a learned girl, a docta puella, drawing attention, I argue, to the learned illusion in her poetry. Sulpicia in these poems chooses to engage with Lucretius's portrayal of female agency and mutual pleasure to assert her gender and to claim the woman's place in Epicurean discourse that was present from its inception. By citing Lucretius and using his own diction to present mutual pleasure as an effective release from cares, she offers a rival to the Epicurean's philosophical principles and inextricably links herself with his lessons on love. So now to Sulpicia and Philodemus, Sulpicia's interest in Epicurean depictions of love in particular can be read into her allusions to Lucretius as well as her engagement with his contemporary Philodemus. Sulpicia interacts with Philodemus in a different way, engaging with his works less on a romantic or sexual level and more on a metapoetic plane. Though the Epicurean Philodemus wrote mainly philosophical prose treatises, the epigrams he composed are known to have influenced the poetry of Augustan Rome. Sulpicia, in particular, engages with Philodemus's paradigm of narrator and beloved. Many lovers um, feature throughout Philodemus's poetry, though the one featured most frequently is Xanthope, variously called Xanthope, Xantho and the diminutive Xantharion, she is as close to Philodemus's elegiac mistress as we can come, and has accordingly been regarded as a precursor to the Puellae of Roman love elegy. But unlike these elegiac Puellae, Xanthope holds a uniquely Epicurean place in Philodemus's poetry. She is both a lover and a fellow philosopher, as David Sider has argued. That Xanthope is the romantic partner of a philosopher is reinforced by her poetic name, the same as the wife of Socrates. Yet it is Xanthope as partner in Philodemus's philosophical discourse that I think speaks most to Sulpic Sulpicia's interest in their interaction. Her engagement with this relationship signals a desire to further acknowledge the woman's part in the Epicurean discourse on love. So the most intriguing point of contact is with an epigram of Philodemus's that Cider posits is a dialogue between the authorial persona and Xanthope. So this is Cider's translation, um, which he stages as this dialogue. The first speaker, the man says, Xantho formed of wax with skin uh, smelling of perfume, with the face of a muse, with splendid voice, a beautiful image of the double-winged pothoi, Pluck for me with your delicate hands a fragrant song. In a solitary rocky bed made of stone, I must surely someday sleep a deathlessly long time. Yes, yes, Xantharion, sing again for me this sweet song. And then she responds, don't you understand, man, you accountant you? You must live forever, you wretch, in a solitary rocky bed. Here, the first speaker calls Xanthope keroplaste formed of wax. This adjective, I argue, suggests a metapoetic play on the wax tablet, in which the beloved becomes literal poetic material. The metapoetry contained in the epithet Keroplaste is echoed in Sulpicia's name for her beloved, Carinthus. As David Russell has argued, the name Carinthus may come from the Greek kerinthos or bee bread, a substance that has associations with honey and importantly with wax, keros in Greek or kera in Latin. Like Philodemus, Sulpicia too has a beloved formed of wax, a point she plays on in poem 313, the first of the quote unquote true Sulpicia poems, where she describes wax tablets that contain a love letter to Carinthus. She says, at last love has come. Such a love that I would have more notoriety if I covered it up 
than if I revealed it to anyone. My muses begged Kitharay and Venus, and she brought him and put him down in my lap. Venus has fulfilled her promises. Let anybody tell of my pleasures, if they will be said not to have had their own. Nor would I want to entrust anything to sealed tablets so that no one read it before my lover. But I enjoy having sinned. To construct the appearance of reputation is tiresome. Let me be said to have been worthy with a worthy subject. As this poem centers on a letter, it's worth mentioning the significance of letter writing among practitioners of Epicurean philosophy, including those in the Roman world. And I'll throw up the famous, uh, the famous, it's not Sappho fresco um, of a woman with her tablets. So we know that letters played a large role in Epicurus's communication with his followers, as is evidenced by the fact that most of his surviving philosophical treatises are in epistolary form. Accordingly, the findings at the Villa of the Papyri in Herculaneum reveal a tradition of mutual citation and quotation that suggests intellectual exchanges happened in writing and in a format akin to the letter. Letters among Epicureans were also convenient fodder for anti-Epicurean discourse. Alcaphron's letters of courtesans from the later imperial period includes a satirical epistle from a well-known Epicurean woman, Leontion, thought to have been a hetaira. She writes to another Hetaira, Lamia, and complains that the Socratizing Epicurus keeps pestering her with letters um, and wants to make her his Xanthope. This parody highlights the frequent epistolary correspondence between Epicurus and his women followers, extant in fragments of letters Epicurus wrote to both Leontion and another woman, Themista. Yet it is precisely the personal nature of the epistolary form that makes Epicurus's letters stylistically attractive. They offer a brand of voyeurism with a third party reading someone else's personal thoughts. This feeling of intrusion on a private moment is often intentionally created, especially in um, fictional literary letters intended for public consumption, like for example, Ovid's Heroides. These letters lure a reader into feeling part of an inner circle or privy to private and potentially damning knowledge. Sulpicia likewise opens up her correspondence to others in poem 313 when she discusses frankly the repercussions of not sealing her tablets or metapoetically her affair with Corinthus. So just to read out that last part again, she says, nor would I want to entrust anything to sealed tablets so that no one read it before my lover. But I enjoy having sinned to construct the appearance of reputation as tiresome. Let me be said to have been worthy with a worthy subject. The metapoetic plane on which this affair operates has a great deal to do with Corinthus's name. Other elegists send missives to their beloveds and sometimes even their own poetry inscribed on wax tablets but Sulpicia conflates lover and letter in writing on a wax tablet to a, main, to a man whose name has wax in associations. As Russell puts it, she writes on her lover, both figuratively and liter literally. In doing so, Sulpicia also creates a play on the elegiac construct in which the beloved exists as the content for poetry, in which, for example, Propertius' Cynthia is not flesh and blood woman, but exists primarily in the poetry of her lover as a literary construct. Sulpicia's beloved Corinthus becomes not only the figurative material for her composition, but the literal medium that contains her elegies. He is doubly formed of wax. Yet uh, Philodemus goes beyond merely envisioning his love Xanthope as encoded in wax. He inscribes himself onto a poetic medium as well. So in this epigram, he says, um, seven years are coming up on 30, papyrus columns of my life now being torn off. Now to Xanthope, white hairs besprinkle me, announcing the age of intelligence. But the harp's voice and revels are still a concern to me and a fire smolders in my insatiable heart. Inscribe her immediately as the Coronis, Mistress Muses, of this madness. Philodemus refers to his life as his poetry, papyrus columns of my life now being torn off. He associates age with gaining wisdom 
and with moving away from music and revelry, even as he laments his continued care for poetry, a mode of writing Epicurus himself disdained. In order to end this madness, the narrator asks the muses to make Xanthope a coronis, a final flourish to his poetic furor. In these verses, grammatically, autain could merely be emphasizing coronida, the final flourish, the coronis. However, Cider's suggestion that autain points to Xanthope herself, that Xanthope can help Philodemus by acting as his partner in their pursuit of Epicurean virtues, makes more enticing the prospect of Xanthope as poetic final flourish, and the epigram as demonstrating her transition from material for poetic inspiration to philosophical equal. These latter images suggest that Philodemus sees Xanthope both as his last subject for poetic celebration and as the philosophical partner who can return him to reason. By speaking of both himself and his beloved as the poetry he is writing, he equalizes them and joins them together in the materials for his compositions. Sulpicia is similarly metapoetic in her poem 13, especially if we consider an alternate version of lines seven to eight. So in this case, Sulpicia envisions not only Corinthus, but also her own po poetic persona as living within the wax on which she writes. So here she says, nor would I want to entrust anything to sealed tablets so that no one read me before my lover. So if we, if we read may here, which is in the manuscript um, instead of nay, and then ut as amended from id, um, we reveal a narrator who sees herself contained in her own poem. Corinthus, as her waxen lover, both receives her letter and is the letter, and they are joined in wax and in Sulpicia's words. As in Philodemus's epigram, narrator and beloved here are equalized, put on the same metapoetic plane. Their relationship can be seen to reveal the standards of the elegiac genre in which lovers exist mainly as the material for poetry. Philodemus's Xanthope exists in wax, but he implies that she is more, a wife, a partner, a force for reason. Sulpicia, as a female elegist in her own right, embodies this role of a woman in philosophical discourse with men, yet she keeps her poetic persona connected to the wax, reinforcing the literary level at which these discourses take place and highlighting the fact that her learned engagement with these Epicurean philosophers can only be acknowledged if others read her, that is her poetry. Okay. So the final section, Sulpicia and Mutua Voluptas. In each of the ways Sulpicia interacts with these two Epicurean authors in her poetry, she continues to underline the notion of Mutua Voluptas, the mutual pleasure that one can share either sexually or philosophically with a partner. She echoes this idea of mutuality in, for example, poem 317, in which um, Sulpicia is sick, perhaps with a love sickness, as is common in elegy, and only wants to get well if Corinthus wants the same, that is, if he loves her too. This kind of commitment to mutual pleasure is further echoed in an aspect of Sulpicia's engagement with Lucretius that I have only touched on briefly, her invocation and evocation of Venus, evident in poem 313, among others. Venus is Lucretius's embodiment of Woluptas and is appropriately present in Sulpicius' poems in her capacity as love goddess. Consider again this passage from poem 313. My muses begged Cytherean Venus and she brought him and put him down in my lap. Venus has fulfilled her promises. Let anybody tell of my pleasures if they will be said not to have had their own. We see here the muses entreating Venus to bring forth the beloved who doubles as the poem to our narrator. Significantly, when Venus brings him, she places him in his lover's lap, Sinum. There are numerous literary parallels with this image, the most intriguing of which for our purposes is Lucretius's description of Mars and Venus in the DRN book one. 
In this passage, Lucretius hymns to Venus and expresses his desire for peace, since she is the only one with sway over Mars, the god of war and her lover. And I'll just read out this one part where he says, uh, for you alone are able to gratify mortals with tranquil peace, since Mars, who has power over weapons, directs the fierce works of war, who often cast himself into your lap, conquered by the eternal wound of love. The tableau <clears throat> imagined here, one lover reclining in the lap of another, is a familiar literary scene. The poetic model for this passage in Lucretius comes from the fifth century philosopher Empedocles, whose own on nature foregrounds personifications of the cosmic forces of love and strife. Dante O'Rourke has demonstrated how impactful these two figures filtered through Lucretius's Venus and Mars have been on the elegists Stibullus, Propertius, and Ovid. Lowell Edmonds points out that this episode has Hellenistic models as well, suggesting that Lucretius draws from the same font as the elegists themselves. He notes similar scenes in Philodemus and Meliager in which a man lies in the lap of a woman. He even goes so far as to suggest that the famous fresco in uh, Pompey's Villa of the Mysteries is a physical instantiation of this familiar literary image with Bacchus in the lap of Ariadne. And so while Sulpicia has a wealth of sources from which she might be drawing for this passage, Lucretius stands out most because Sulpicia often draws comparisons between herself and Venus in her poetry. In poem 3.8, for example, and this is the first of the garland, Sulpicia is imagined by the narrator as embodying or even rivaling the goddess of love in the eyes of Mars. So the narrator says, Sulpicia is adorned for you on your calends, great Mars. Come from the sky yourself to see her if you are wise. Venus will forgive this, but you, violent one, be careful that your weapons don't fall disgracefully as you wonder at her. The mention of both Mars and Venus here is notable. O'Rourke has argued that Lucretius's Venus prefigures his woman enjoying the mutual pleasures of sex in DRN Book 4. In Sulpicia's styling as Venus, then, she demonstrates that she has a sexual power that equals that of the goddess of love over Mars. She shows that she has sexual agency. Furthermore, in poem 3.9, Sulpicia worries for Corinthus as he goes on a hunt. She vows that she will be happy only when people are talking about her lying with Corinthus and if they're talking about her gaudia, her pleasures. And she calls them the joys of eager Venus. These assertions are similar to the sentiments Lucretia expresses in poem 313, where she appears to encourage a readership to read about her sexual pleasures, her mutual pleasure with Corinthus. In addition, in 39, she writes, uh, now let there be no Venus without me linking herself and specifically her sexual relationship with Corinthus to the goddess of love. She contrasts Venus with the goddess Diana here, the goddess of chastity, emphasizing that by Venus, she means sex. So let there be no Venus without me, therefore translates to Corinthus don't have sex without me. Yet metapoetically, this statement can also point to the mutuality of pleasure in sex and the mutual exchange of philosophical ideas that Sulpicia has endorsed. Without her, that is without Sulpicia's poetry, elegy lacks the voice of a female counterpart to the male. The Epicureans of the late Republic, Lucretius in particular, um, similarly lack a female viewpoint on love. Though Sulpicia does not necessarily endorse Epicureanism in general, she certainly challenges Lucretius's brand of Epicureanism in particular. And one of the ways in which she does this is by pointing out that Lucretius's Venus has sexual agency, that the woman who experiences shared pleasures in book four has sexual agency, and that therefore perhaps mutual love where the woman has as much agency as the man is an acceptable alternative to the complete rejection of love Lucretius recommends. Sulpicia defiantly ends poem 3.9 by saying to her lover, but you leave eagerness for hunting to your father and you yourself quickly run back into my lap. 
Here she winks again at Lucretius's Venus, whose lover Mars lies in her lap as she embraces and celebrates her own sexuality. Notably, Lucretius imagines a Venus who will use her power over Mars to ignore him to the idea of Roman peace. So he says, goddess, having poured your sacred body over and around him as he reclines, pour forth sweet sayings from your mouth, seeking for the Romans, glorious one, serene peace. Venus is the one prompting a retreat from war and political turmoil, embodying, as it were, the very goals of a good Epicurean. What this Lucretian passage does in effect then is highlight the role women can play in engendering a loosening of cares, that is in affecting ataraxia. Venus is the only one who can achieve peace for the Romans because she is the only one with power over Mars, her lover. That power is a sexual power. This scene thus looks forward to the DRN passage with which I began, in which Lucretius creates the image of a woman as a partner in the shared pleasures of sex in Comunia Gaudia. So if we return to poem 313, we see that Sulpicia, like Venus, uses her sexuality to persuade men, namely a male readership, that she has something to say about love. She takes her place in the elegiac canon by opening up her pleasures, mea gaudia, for the world to see. And in doing so, she becomes a female counterpart in a male discourse, much like the earlier Hetairai of the garden. Those were perhaps, in fact, some of the most likely women to engage with a philosophy that promoted a kind of utilitarian sex practice, one dissociated from the obsessive attachment with which Lucretius defines amor. Sulpicia transcends this dissociation and asserts mutuality as her own solution to the problem of love's anxieties, marking herself both as a learned poet and perhaps even as a rival philosopher. When Sulpicia writes here, mea gaudia naret, let anybody tell of my pleasures, and chooses this word gaudia, she uses a word Lucretius makes explicitly sexual in the DRN when he employs it to describe the pleasures a woman can experience in sexual intercourse. And significantly, in the extant Latin literature before the time when Sulpicius poems are thought to have been written, it is only in Lucretius that a woman experiences Gaudia. This makes it all the more noteworthy when Sulpicia in 313 encourages readers to let anybody tell of my pleasures. We can imagine Sulpicia here again as a kind of Venus herself. Just as Mars reclines in Venus's lap, her lover Corinthus lies in Sulpicia's lap. And just as Venus can shape the discussion on war, Sulpicia is a woman capable of shaping the discussion on love for an audience of women and men alike. It is in the several allusive ways I have presented that Sulpicia inserts herself not just into the poetic or elegiac discourse on love, but into the Epicurean one, a discourse that from its inception included women. In my focus on pleasure here, I have passed over other enticing possible moments of Epicurean engagement. Uh, for example, Sulpicia's claim that she has left her senses, those Epicurean modes of engaging with the world, in the city, which is sweeter, dulcius, than the country, sweetness being a defining element of the experience of ataraxia in the opening to DRN2. Uh, a number of plays on the elegiac notion of Cora or anxiety with Epicurean undertones and instructions to Corinthus at one point to put aside his fear. In what I've presented here, however, Sulpicia engages specifically with Lucretius's discussion of voluptas, a word that Lucretius codes throughout the DRN um, at times as sexual, and philosophical pleasure. She sees the sexual aspect realized in her own poetry and the philosophical aspect in her learned engagement with both Lucretius and Philodemus. Among these three authors then, there is another kind of mutua voluptas, shared pleasure between men and women, a shared literary discourse. And although engaging with two Epicureans likely of an earlier time, this learned woman does not make herself the final flourish of the pen, closing out the conversation on pleasure, both sexual and philosophical, elegiac and Epicurean. Rather, 
she opens the door for other elegists to engage with Epicurean poetry in their own ways and to engage with her own poetry, creating yet another instance of shared discourse and of mutual pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Erin, um, if I may. A question that comes from really stepping back for a moment for the, 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 the wonderful demonstration uh, you have offered to us between theories of love, voice, performance, and metapoetic uh, entanglements. A question which would be, um, ah, I see Judith Hallett's hand, just one second. Uh, Judith, thank you so much. Um, well, could you at some point, uh, in a sense, zoom upon uh, this tension between Heck, Venus, and Snobis in Lucretia? So, the natural movement of the simulacrum, which is inevitable because uh, puberty is there, because the body is ready, because simulacra flow and, 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 and fleet and float around all the time on the one hand. And then, um, and then love with precisely its chains, its insatiability and the impossibility of making one out of two, uh, which culminates in this sort of uh, Baroque uh, scene of love making in the Dererum Natura. So I have this question, but perhaps this could emerge in, in your uh, following comments. Uh, perhaps uh, we can listen to Judy Hallett's question now. Judith? Uh, yeah, thanks, Erin. And I, you've seen the question in the chat, um, and I know we're getting into speculative new historicism <laughs> and biographical criticism where we may not want to necessarily go. Um, but Sulpicia is unique among our elegists in that we know about her actual human relationship with a slave. And I was wondering about any connections that you might want to postulate uh, between the fact that Sir Witium Amoris for Sulpicia is mutuous, that they are, she and her lover are equally under the um, control of Amor. And we know from the elegiac epitaph that she wrote to her own, to honor her own female um, slave lectrix, uh, Petale, that she and her female slave literary educator had this wonderful, um, mutually um, gratifying, emotionally charged relationship. So, um, yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, what, what, what do we want? Where do we want to go with that? And yeah, I'll well, I mean, it's such a fascinating point to bring up. Um, and I don't know if I dare speculate, um, but it is so that's all we do. It is yeah. so fun. That's all we do. Exactly. This entire, <laughs> this entire yeah. talk is speculation because, you know, what if we find out tomorrow that there was, you know, there was no Sulpicia? And, um, uh, everyone who who says that you know, all the sufficient poems are just written by by other authors is right or by different authors, right? Funny different authors, right? But, um, but it's so fun to think yeah. with. Um, you know, it I it it's tough to say. Um, this idea of uh, the changing of the Servitia Morris relationship is um, something that you know is I'm not the the first one to have noticed right so I mean in um, Laurel Fulkerson's commentary there's there's note of this it's like, oh interesting how Sulpicia thinks about Sir Wittiam Morris differently than these other elegists um you know I'm reading that through an Epicurean lens and seeing something philosophical in that um but there is absolutely no reason why a personal relationship shouldn't also inform um that understanding of you know, what we call servitium amoris, but, you know, this, this sort of idea that love, which can take a number of forms and does not have to be sexual in any way, um, you know, can, can be mutual, can be shared. And I don't know, I was just teaching Roman slavery to uh, some of my students earlier today. And I think, you know, it, it is wonderful if they did have this you know, relationship. I think it's also notable though, that, you know, if this woman was, um, 
was enslaved, she is then subservient. And so can there be this true sort of mutuality? Um, and so this now makes me wonder um, about uh, the power dynamics in Sulpicia's mutual love. Uh, does she really see um, herself as equal to the man or does she maybe see him as in fact subservient to her, especially considering the fact that there are many who identify Corinthus as having slave status or certainly a lower status than Sulpicia. So I don't know that that's an answer, but I love it. And it's, and it's great to think with. Thanks, Judy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Judith. Uh, now we have a question by Ruth, Ruth Caston, who knows all these things very, very, very well. Thank you. Thank you, oh, no, I... Judy and Ruth, for being here. It's Thank really you so much. <laughs> Thank you. No, I learned, uh, I liked your talk a lot. And I um, had a question that actually touches on what you just said about the way that the relationship may seem equal and mutual in some ways, but also involves some things which seem like there's also a hierarchy. Yeah. And um, I thought that this came up in an interesting way using Epicurean sounding vocabulary in, in a poem that you quoted a few lines from, that was 313, the one where she, Sulpicia yeah. is ill and she says, I've got, you know, got a morbus and I, she says, I need, you know, I'm not going to be able to overcome this disease uh, without your help, Corinthus. And then he's described in the last line of the poem as having a lento um, pectore, yes, as yes. if he's the one who is completely untouched by any kind of concern, which, which seems to not only create an imbalance in their relationship, but make him sound more Epicurean than, than she does. And, and I, I guess the, when I was looking at my text, I see that in the preceding poem, he's there, he's described, described as Sekurus. Yep, I was just gonna bring that up. <laughs> yeah, so I just wanted to hear a little bit more about what you make of their relationship and the way that his characterization in those, in those poems. Absolutely. Thank you so much um, for your question and for coming to the talk because I'm so indebted to your work um, on Lucretius and the Elegist. And um, I think absolutely that if we look at things from Corinthus's perspective, it starts to look really different. Um, so the say chorus that you pointed out is exactly what I was going to point to, right? He um, uh, in, so oh, I don't know if I can, if I can share this I'll just kind of share. I just pulled it up on the Latin library real quick so, I, so everyone can see some Latin. Um, so this is the one where uh, Corinthus um, is uh, not having prop, not showing proper attention or cura significantly, right, for um, Sulpicia when she is sick and she um, only wants to overcome her illness if he uh, also can become, uh, if he also wants her to become well, that is. And so the lento pectora you mentioned is down here at the end. Yeah, so he's the one who is um, maybe not living up to this idea of mutuality that she has presented and that she is promoting. Um, and I think the, the, the say chorus up here um, in the this poem where um, you know he basically isn't uh, caring enough for her he in fact seems interested in another woman um, per perhaps a prostitute um, more than Sulpicia is really telling um, especially because if we think in an Epicurean context okay we're not supposed to have romantic attachments um, and you know sex with a what a, a a wide wandering Venus, right, is the thing uh, that is recommended by Lucretius. So perhaps in this poem, which is um, 16, I know it says four here, but poem 316, um, perhaps Corinthus is the one who is in fact acting as a good Epicurean. Um, and Sulpicia, who I, I do not believe is trying to be an Epicurean, right, who's, who has sort of her own thing going on, is frustrated by this. Um, and I think echoed again in 317 with the Kura, right? Um, uh, this, th this pious care, right? This devoted care or maybe anxiety over um, your Puella, your mistress, um, that's what's lacking. And, and you mentioned, you know, there's Lucretian vocabulary here and we have morbos and Ill illness, of course, we can think of, you know, the plague, um, which is a whole nother a whole nother um, aspect of Lucretius to think about. But uh, yeah, I, I think absolutely, I completely agree that um, Corinthus is not living up to this idea of mutuality that Sulpicia endorses. I hope that addressed your question. 
question is more because all of my knowledge of Epicureanism and anti-Epicureanism is filtered through 18th century French philosophers who are obsessed with Lucretius. But when you were talking, it was really making me think of one philosopher in particular, Emilie du Châtelet, who was a physicist. Um, she was really obsessed with Lucretius, but also wrote as a woman um, on female pleasure. Mm -hmm. um, but she linked it especially to happiness because she talks about she talks about sort of the gendered nature of love most in her discourse on happiness. Mm -hmm. And she really does something different from a lot of the male philosophers of that time because they're all writing discourses on happiness. They're all exploring what happiness means. And she takes it in a very sensual and bodily way and talks about love and female pleasure. So I'm just wondering if um, female pleasure or sexual pleasure with Sulpicia gets linked to any emotions or affects in that way. Is it is it linked in any way to happiness? I'm just like yeah, really it is. The it is. <laughs> it is. That word gaudia that I kept bringing out is usually just translated as joys. Okay. And in Lucretius, he uses the word gaudia five times, I think, four or five times. And um, it's it's pretty much always sexual, though there's one moment where um, he's describing animals experiencing Gaudia. And in some translations, some published translations, it's just like, oh, they're like expressing joy, like they're making sounds that are joyful, as opposed to like having sex with one another or being aroused or being in heat, something like that. So um, yeah, that word Gaudia in the plural um, typically uh, references, um, you know, maybe sexual pleasures, especially after Lucretius. Um, but in the, in the singular, it just means, yeah, joy, happiness. So there's absolutely a strong connection there. Um, and uh, yeah, something that I, I've talked about sort of in, in other um, contexts, uh, thinking about female pleasure and like the, you know, the history of the female orgasm and things like that, you know, this word Gaudia comes up a lot um, with that association of, of happiness. And um, I mean, we can, we can debate about the, the sort of pleasure aspect or specific orgasm aspect, because I have my own opinions on that. But in, in poets like Ovid, um, we certainly see Gaudia as, you know, sort of pleasures and happiness in the same. Yeah. Thanks, Tracy. Thank you. Uh, Lena Barsky, yes, go ahead. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, I was getting a message saying I couldn't unmute, but thank you so much for this talk. I feel like you packed so much into just an hour and I was like, oh my God, that was a total masterclass. So thank you. Um, kind of building off the last question, actually, I was wondering, about the interplay between Sulpicia and her persona and like the Ovidian persona and the way that Ovid, at least in the Amores, very clearly doesn't want anything to do with Lucretius, doesn't want anything to do with Epic, like refuses to be in conversation with these people or these themes, but still builds on them. Like Gaudia shows up in Ovid, right? Or we have yeah. sort of the, the sensuousness or the overt sexuality that's described <laughs> in, in Lucretius in that passage you showed us. And so I was just wondering if you had thoughts on their interplay, because I feel like that is something that I'm trying to think through in my own approaches to Sulpicia right now. And I'd love to hear your thoughts. Absolutely. 100%. So um, yes, I, I have, um, I have also written on, on Ovid and Lucretius and um, specifically Ovid's amatory poetry, right? So I actually see um, the amores and, and the ars and the remedia as being um, all linked together in their response to Lucretius. And, and yes, I mean, so, so I, I have an article, I just, it just came out literally just in January. Um, it's that it's in that book, um, uh, Philosophy and Ovid, Ovid as Philosopher. So um, you can, you can read it there, but um, I'll just kind of give you the, the cliff notes. Um, so I see Ovid as actually not, he's definitely engaging with Lucretius, but I don't know that he's like, I don't want anything to do with this. I see him as trying to correct Lucretius in the same way that uh, Sulpicia is doing. And this is, um, you know, all, all building off of Ruth Caston's work who, who asked um, uh, the second question. So uh, basically um, I see Ovid as employing a, an Epicurean um, mode of instruction 
when he addresses Lucretian themes. So I argue that he uses parecia, frank criticism. Um, this explains the repetition that Ovid uses. He takes like the same passages and uses them over and over. Um, and this is uh, one of the one of the principles of, of parecia as Philodemus outlines. So Philodemus comes back in. Um, but specifically, he Ovid that is uses Lucretian diction to beat Lucretius at his, at his own game. And, you know, this is um, uh, not, not only uh, my idea, right, but um, Julia uh, has published on this. And this is, you know, sort of a, a really um, great and exciting reading of poems like the Rs, right, where they're all of a sudden philosophical and not, um, not just sort of mockery. Uh, and, and so um, watching Ovid, um, sort of transition through these different relationships with Lucretius. This is how I read the poems. So in the in the Rs, uh, sorry, no, let's start in the Amores, Ovid is kind of playing the fool. He is playing the role of the stultus that Lucretius describes, you know, and he's like, oh, these fools that fall in love and they look at these women and these women are, are ugly, but they're like playing up all their characteristics and it's, oh yeah, no, we're just gonna, you know, make her, make her into something beautiful in our minds. Um, one has to sort of welcome misogyny into the room for a while when dealing with these texts, but um, yeah. So he, he sort of plays that part and, and does it really um, deliberately in his poems. And then in the R's, he plays the teacher, right? And so he's um, rivaling Lucretius as this teacher on love. And in there, we have a, a great passage with Gaudia showing up where he talks about um, basically how to, how to bring a woman to climax. Um, and it's not by having sex with her, spoiler alert, you know, like he's, he's like, he's really in it with the Gaudia. Um, and then uh, in the Remedia becomes the sort of doctor to heal, right? Um, all of the problems that he created. I mean, heal, he's not really doing anything better. Um, but uh, it's there, I think that he, he sort of really emphasizes all of the all of these little bits that he's been repeating and all of these engagements subtle engagements with lucretius he kind of brings them all to a head in the remedia and that's where he's like boom here's my rival philosophy and if you've stuck with me through all of these poems you can see it so that's my opinion i'm sure not everyone agrees with me but definitely check out that that article and we can talk more <laughs> oh no you're muted <laughs> sorry <laughs> No, I was just going to say, that's great. Thank you so much. And I just think to me, there's just something like maybe just in my mind, I just feel like there's a rivalry between Sulpicia and Ovid in some way, where it's like an anything you can do, I can do better. And I'm a woman. Yeah. Well, you know, I, and I just think the engagement with Lucretius, I think just only adds an element to that, but that could also just be like my sort of fan construction of both of their work. No, well, I, I think what's so funny is that there's there's so many people who who have thought in the past that the amicus poems were written by Ovid. Oh my God. Garland was written by Ovid. <laughs> no way. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Nice. See, I didn't even know that. So people, That's some so people wild. wrote them, that Ovid wrote them as a really popular theory. So you, you may in fact be right. <laughs> it may be. Spot on. Um, maybe, or, but maybe that's not a rivalry. Maybe that's if we, if we read Ovid as the author of the Amicus poems, all of a sudden he's like you know pull, pulling out all of these little breadcrumbs in these. Yeah, he's found poem them, and you know really <laughs> expanding upon them in an exciting way. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Well, thank you. Lots of food for thought, and just thank you again. <laughs> You're welcome. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you all again. And uh, if you allow me, I would like now to go back to my question. Um, and also, uh, Erin, to rebound on the word romantic that you mm. have used. I know that uh, uh, in in English and in um, you know Anglo Anglophone and Anglographic uh, scholarship. Uh, in a sense, romantic is the adjective that goes with love as opposed to sex. And I would like to, perhaps to, to raise a question mark on, on the, the entrapment uh, in which we find ourselves once we start to use that language, because to go back precisely to Lucretius, um, 
Lucretius, vis-a-vis uh, -vis which, yes, Ovid offers a, a, an outsmarting philosophy. I think that Ovid is a philosopher, not just, you know, in touch and go kind of moments, but there is really a, a systematic thinking about everything from an ontology to love in Ovid. And uh, that uh, uh, Ovid outsmarts Lucretius at the Epicurean game without, without presenting himself with a little flag of Epicurean follower, but there is a real complete rethinking of the experience of pleasure as possible because desire is not insatiable. And therefore, I think that we have to read of it all against, so to speak, Lucretius. Mm -hmm. So to go back to Lucretius precisely, what's wrong with love, really? You know, uh, William Fitzgerald could say, uh, you know, with love, everything stops. So the movement of the atoms, the movement of the simulacra, the movement of body getting together is somehow blocked in those chains, in that, in that trying to struggle, to kiss, to, to bite, to incorporate, to penetrate, and to make one out of two. And so the, the word romantic, for me, it's not really at home in that bed because it seems to me that there is a hyper uh, erotic intensity actually, which precisely goes beyond penetration because penetration is a contemporary obsession that has nothing to do with ancient sexuality and sensuality. But if we, in a sense, clean our desk and uh, stop focusing on penetration, then you have a hyper-erotic attempt to intertwine corporeally with the other person in which all the senses are involved at the outset in the first place, because this is lovemaking, as we all know. You know, any kind of lovemaking, uh, he is made of many different gestures and many different uh, sensorial experiences and words, because love and language go together right. and sounds. So, um, you know, if we read Lucretius, it seems to me with that um, more capacious notion of sensuality and we look at the way he represents and depicts lovemaking, then perhaps it's not the so quote-unquote romantic aspect of it that's wrong, but it's the, the fusional one. Mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, precisely too much body, there is too much body, too much desire to uh, to do what Hephaestus, you know, promises to do in Aristophanes' speech in Plato, <laughs> to yes. build, to fuse. Um, yes. and, 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 this and that's the problem. The problem of the chains with the memory of the Odyssey, with the memory of Plato's take on the Odyssey, etc. And uh, some yeah. would say Empedocles, blah, blah, blah. But um, so... Um, What's wrong with, with, with love? That's, <laughs> That's my question. It's a disingenuous <laughs> question, as you know. <laughs> no, no, it's not. our conversation has already started. But let's <laughs> what's pretend wrong? that yeah. we meet and I ask you, what's wrong with love? Yeah, well, I think, so I, there are a few points I want to address. First, you are not the first to criticize me for using romantic as opposed to erotic. For, for, well, maybe not criticize, but point out that perhaps erotic is the is the better word choice and I think um I think now that I've heard that a few times I just need to go through and and change that right because you're absolutely right and I think for me what I'm seeing as the problem with what's wrong with love right in Lucretius is the attachment right emotionally um which is why I was using this word romantic in kind of a more modern sense it's true um I think though this kind of goes back to the hike buenos est nobis right because leading up to that we have this um description of sort of the the physical 
the physical reaction, right? When you have arousal, um, when you have ejaculation, um, and it's this, it's this sort of reaction, right? It's not a response that you can control, it's this reaction. And um, the one aspect that you can control is um, uh, whether or not you allow that um, reaction to happen with someone you are emotionally invested in. And so that emotional investment is what is wrong with love because Lucretius is, is fine essentially with sex um, and, and even with potentially marriage, right? If we look at, you know, book five. Um, so yeah, the, the problem seems to be the, um, the attachment. And um, I think this notion of what Venus is, is the bigger question. And this might be the thing that we can talk about more in the, in the seminar, you know, in our discussion after, because she is such a complicated um, figure in Lucretius's poem. And I, you know, said several times in my talk that she is his sort of embodiment of pleasure, but that means different things at different times. Exactly. Yeah. And so it's really hard to pin down a hike way, no, hike way, no beast, right? Yes. What about Illa Wainos, <laughs> sort of. No, 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 no. Yeah, so I don't know that I have a I don't know that I have a great answer there, but I appreciate your point about the erotic attachment, and that's that's at least what I see as the problem with with love and Lucretius. Yes, and it, it, what I I I could uh, perhaps add to once again to rebound on 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 what you are showing and arguing for is that. Uh, precisely, you have this uh, Venus uh, Volgivaga or Vulgivaga, which is the remedy. There is a yeah. <laughs> there, there, <laughs> yeah. there are remedies uh, for Lucretius, and the remedies is to flee from the simulacra to avoid uh, love. So it is a negative art of love, mm -hmm. um, and I think that this is perhaps the uh, one one of the many possible really specific challenges for Ovis taking up the project of an art of love, but of, of an art of love inspired by the possibility of success, not by this, you know, prohibition, you, you, will, you will flee. Um, and precisely the remedy to, to love understood as attachment and fixation and wanted to make uh, one out of two is plural sex, is to go back to the circulation of simulacra and to the multiplicity of beautiful bodies, because that is uh, not only natural, but really pleasurable, because after all, there are moments of pleasure. In the experience of insatiability, including in bed, there are moments of relief and pleasure, and those ha have to be recognized from an Epicurean point of view. Yeah. However, you have to go for those, not for precisely wasting yourself uh, for nothing with uh, an individual person. So I, yes, I entirely agree. And I agree also on what you say about the family. Yes, marriage is necessary because you have to procreate. And, and the nature, the nature of things wants procreation and therefore um, that aspect of intercourse is also, uh, is also precious. So you have the sort of- uh, Yeah, completely. You know, simulacrum uh, guided and the uh, procreation inspired experience of <laughs> sex which is indispensable thank you thank you thank you again to all of you